I have a love-hate relationship with Gran Turismo 7. Like, I love this game. As with every Gran Turismo, I am still thoroughly enjoying myself with GT7. At the point of finishing the script, I've played it around 160 hours and put in roughly 9,000 miles in just these first five weeks. I'm truly having a ton of fun with GT7, as always. There isn't a moment where I'm not playing it where I didn't wish I was. What's more, the PS4 version, at least on PS4 Pro, is thankfully fully worth your time and money. If you're okay with the slower loading times and a presentation that is great, but isn't going to blow you away if you've played GT Sport. It's exactly the game you were sold through the PS5 version's marketing, outside of a few visual differences. However, as someone who didn't fall off of the GT series after GT4, and instead played hundreds and hundreds of hours of each of GT5, GT6, and GT Sport, I am also not going to misrepresent the game as some return to form that brings you back to GT4, like so many others are doing. Is it very, very much just like GT4 in most ways? Yeah, of course. But it's not a return to form because GT5, 6, and Sport were 90% of what 4 was already. Many of the people reviewing this game and giving it super high scores seem to have the mistaken impression that the series drastically moved away from GT4's design and hasn't been back there for around 17 years. And yes, each of the subsequent games, while adding their own fantastic bits to the formula, did remove things here and there. Sometimes these things stayed removed for just that one game. Other times they were removed initially, but later added back in through updates. But like, GT5 still had used cars. Sport eventually got a whole normal single player career mode. GT5 and 6 had dynamic weather, time of day, and mechanical car damage, which was brought back in GT7. GT Sport at launch was the biggest shift away from what GT4 perfected, but even then, it wasn't long before it was updated to more or less encapsulate around 90% of what GT4 was. It's like the people acting like this is a rebirth of classic GT didn't play Sport past launch or something. As someone who has played every entry since GT3 religiously, as someone who considers GT4 one of his favorite games of all time, and also considers himself a massive GT fan, as someone who has literally played thousands of hours of these games, GT7 is not a return to form, unless you're only comparing it directly to GT Sport at launch, or cherry picking bits and pieces from each game after GT4 and then mushing them together to form a twisted whole that can represent all three of the PS3 and PS4 era games. Yes, I know Gran Turismo 5 Prologue exists. Yes, I completed that too. No, I'm not counting it. I do enjoy it, but it's not a normal GT game. I don't want to suggest that GT7 doesn't bring back basically everything that was missing in bits and pieces from each of these games individually, but what I do want to suggest is that the vast majority of things people see GT7 as never left, or never left for long. Again, outside of specifically during the launch window of GT Sport. I also, therefore, do not want to give the game a pass like so many others are, just because it conglomerates all of these occasionally missing features into a single game. Do I like that they're all basically back? Yes. Do I think they've added more worthwhile things to the package on top of that? Yes. Am I angry that they didn't bring back online shuffle racing from GT5? Absolutely. Does that have anything to do with what I'm talking about right now? Absolutely not. I am loving this game. As a Gran Turismo fan, I am thoroughly enjoying every moment that I'm playing GT7, and am even more excited to play it with better graphics and lightning quick loading times if I can ever get my hands on a damned PS5. But it is also an immense disappointment on so many levels that people are overlooking because they're too busy pretending that all GT7 needs to be in order to reach iconic status is GT4 again, a nearly 17-year-old game. 
many of the features GT7 is getting huge heaps of praise for were novel back when they were first introduced in games like GT2 and GT4, but they aren't novel any longer. And their implementation looking back and looking at GT7 is decidedly shallow now because they have never progressed much. What's more, GT7 carries over issues that have plagued Gran Turismo, and indeed most sim racers, since GT1. GT1 was more or less the birth of the single player sim racing formula. And while many have tinkered with it in different ways, very few have actually tried to revolutionize it, let alone succeeded. And GT has been content to sit on a career design that was solidified in GT2, polished in GT4, and then more or less never tinkered with beyond minor nuances. It is important to recognize that the major praise GT7 is getting is due to their re-emphasis on single player sim racing career mode design, and the fact that nearly all of the best sims it's competing with are massively behind in at least one or two major ways, whether that be graphics, content, variety, progression, performance, race options, teaching tools, control polish, general game polish, or realistically, a combination of these. But it's important to keep in mind that GT7 is largely more of the same for the series. It's not a refreshing reboot of things not seen for decades, and it's not a drastic transformation into something new. So with that in mind, why have we still not seen qualifying laps come back for well over a decade? Why are nearly all of the single player races rolling starts? Why can't we turn on or off things like mechanical damage as we see fit? Why are we still just given a giant, bland, lifeless checklist of events and series to do, with no meaningful context, laughably lenient regulations, and no depth? Is this the career mode you actually want out of a sim racer? Out of GT? We had this not too long after Sport launched, and we've had it in every previous game. You have literally had access to this in GT Sport for years at this point. Some people are arguing it's great to see the return of license tests too. They never left. What in the world are you talking about? I love Gran Turismo. I really do. I love that it's a series about cars and car history and car culture. I've always said that the other sim racers are games for people who like racing, while GT is the series for people who like cars. It's the sim racer for car nerds, not just racing enthusiasts. That's what makes it stand out. But also, as a racing game, and as a simulation, it has gotten pitiful purely because it hasn't progressed for the 17 years since GT4. I made a video in 2021 about how I would design a sim racing career mode, one that actually thought about it like a career, that took things from all sorts of racing games, sims and arcade alike. Most of what I suggested wouldn't be particularly difficult to implement in the grand scheme of things. Why are we settling on this checklist of generic races purely because GT is a prestigious racing series? Yes, this problem isn't relegated to just GT. Forza has stagnated since Forza 3, if you ask me. Project Cars tried a few new things but was bare bones as heck. Assetto Corsa was even more bare bones. Why are we not demanding more than what we were offered in GT2 and arguably GT1, at the dawn of the modern sim racing genre, a quarter of a century ago? I know this front-loaded rant has gone on for a while now, but I have to stress this reality. We should not be treating GT7 as some spectacular return to form purely because we either buried our heads in the sand since GT4 and just want that nostalgic high, nor because we can't see far enough out of our own asses to recognize that this genre has mostly been stagnant in terms of single player design since its rise to prominence literally decades ago. That does not mean that GT7 is a bad game overall. It doesn't mean that we can't enjoy it for our own individual reasons, but I'm not interested in pretending that it's outdated, shallow, unbalanced career mode, the thing it was marketed on and that everyone was drooling over and is giving it high scores for, is anything but aggressively mediocre at best. I love GT7, but in many ways, it's also an insult to its own legacy. <sighs> 
Before we dive into the specifics of why that is, though, it's worth taking a quick side trip to the other side of the coin, into the controversy surrounding the game. I don't want to spend too much time on this if I can help it, despite the fact that I've already written around 15 pages on it that I decided not to post. The misinformation and disinformation surrounding this game is ridiculous, and the hate campaign based on feelings instead of facts is truly baffling. It's made discussion of the game legitimately unfun to have, because everyone wants to talk about nothing but the economy, and then subsequently act like everything else in the game is a problem because of that. I've seen major YouTubers claim everything from that the game is so glitchy that it barely functions, to that it's missing major features that were in every other GT, to that the servers regularly go down for over a day at a time, to that the graphics look like they're from the PS3 era, and more. It's been called the most broken game, the most overhyped game, and the most predatory game since this console generation started, none of which is remotely accurate. It's important to understand that Polyphony Digital has always had a certain type of design for their games. It has never been about collecting every single car like their fucking Pokemon. The economy in GT7 is objectively very similar to all of the previous games, with GT Sport being the one that has the most lucrative racing if you grind the best races to grind using very specific vehicle setups and strategies that are kind of exploits. I did all the math in that other script, from GT3 forward. The car pricing models are largely the same across every game, and this isn't even the first GT with microtransactions anyway. What's more, these microtransactions are never pushed on the player in any way, contrary to what you might have heard. This, this, this little thing here, is what people are considering pushy, in-your-face microtransactions. This is what they're considering the most predatory game this generation. This little plus sign here whenever you purchase a car. Even if you are somehow paying so little attention that you try to purchase something you don't have enough credits for. And aside from that small plus sign, the only other way I can find to buy currency is by clicking on your money at the top of the screen. Something I only found out because I was looking for ways to buy more credits, to see why everyone was so upset. There's literally no other reason to click on your credits at the top of the screen, and no other way I can find to buy credits in-game. Which means the only remaining option besides those two is directly through the PlayStation Store. Polyphony is known for being extremely fair with their players. They give away whole sequels worth of content for free through updates, and while they don't hand out bazillions of credits and cars quite as readily as something like Forza, that has also never been part of their design ethos. GT wants and has always wanted you to earn cars so that they have value, and you'll actually try them out. It's designed to be paced out, rather than just shove metal with wheels and upgrade money down your throat. And it's also important to note that you can earn over a quarter of the cars in the game for free, just by beating all of the single player content that was available at launch. Many of these cars are of the more expensive variety too. Beyond that, the vast, vast majority of cars in the game are 450,000 credits or less anyway, which is chump change. People like to make a big deal out of how much real world money it would cost to buy one of the very few 20 million credit cars. As if prices like that are the norm in the game, or even anything other than exceedingly rare. They make clickbait articles and videos like this every single time a particularly popular game has microtransactions. Sometimes it is very warranted, but other times it makes no sense to say, look at the most expensive thing in this game and look at how expensive it is to buy using purely your real world money. These people even sometimes suggest that these are the best cars in the game, which is hilariously untrue, like seriously. No 20 million credit 1962 Ferrari 250 GTO is beating a 2.5 million credit Jaguar XJR9, or getting anywhere close. And no 2.5 million credit Jaguar XJR9 is going to be even close to as drivable as a modern Toyota TS050 hybrid, Mazda LM55 VGT GR1, 
1 or Peugeot 908 HDI FAP, which sell for just 1 million credits each in Brand Central. The reality is every car you'll need to beat all of the content in the game at launch is 450,000 credits or less. Most of them are far less, or are straight up given to you for free through the cafe menus. You can finish the entire game without a single grind, and without even thinking about spending real money on credits, without even trying. It's not even like you need to buy multiples of the 450,000 credit GT3 cars, since if you have one, the regulations on them are tight enough that it will be competitive in single player. And if you want a Le Mans car, one of the actual cars from the fastest regulation category, then you need to spend just 1 million credits a single time. I got 11 million credits from just the career at launch, before any of the economy changes from later updates. That was just from beating all of the licenses, missions, and world circuit events, as well as the circuit experiences before they drastically boosted the payouts of those. I struggle to see why any of this is unfair, and again, the best grinds in GT7 weren't really that much worse than those in every game preceding GT Sport, even after the update that nerfed them, with GT Sport's best payouts being the anomaly in the series. You have never been able to earn every car or even a third of the cars or even more than a couple of the most expensive cars in GT without grinding. Ever. It's always been part of the design to not grind, to continue to race and enjoy the game over the years and slowly accrue cars, instead of trying to earn them all in the first month and then drop the game. And that's part of the design that a lot of hardcore fans like. Many of us enjoy actually earning cars, instead of having them handed to us constantly. I'm not saying it's wrong that Forza does the opposite, but isn't it interesting how many people complain that Forza devalues cars by shoving them down your throat? You don't have to agree with the people that enjoy the fact that GT has always been this way, but don't act like the design is purely fueled by evil intentions just because you don't understand it. And no, I don't think if there's no reason for the microtransactions to be there, why are they there, is really fair either. GT Sport gave out 168 cars and 18 tracks with 31 layouts for free across its lifespan through updates, on top of things like all the career races, a circuit experience for each of the new tracks it added, and other features. These games aren't spat out and then sequelized a year or two later. They get some of the most extensive support in the industry for free, and without a massive expectation that you grind your head off to earn said free content. You don't have to grind to play new events, or drive new tracks, and most cars that are added are on the cheaper end, usually they're new sports cars that are between 20,000 and 50,000 credits. They basically cost nothing to the player. Instead, the cost is primarily to the development studio. It costs them a lot of money in time, licensing, etc. to make this content available for free. I'm an artist, so I know what it's like to make things and have people devalue it like this for no reason. Like it or not, they're artists too. Their work has value, and I don't think it's fair to suggest that they aren't allowed to monetize their art in some way post-launch to continue with that support and all of the rest of the stuff that goes into maintaining a game. Let alone a game that is home to a professional online racing motorsport championship. Because don't forget that the racing here in sport mode is taken very seriously. For crying out loud, GT is also supposed to be coming to the actual Olympics soon. It's that important. Handling stuff like that isn't free either. Shouldn't we be happy that the microtransactions in this game aren't really affecting the design so far, and are barely noticeable? That they're not stripping the post-launch content out of the free bin and charging for it with DLC packs instead? That the payouts are realistically still around as good as GT has always had, if not significantly better a lot of the time? Other complaints make little sense as well, like the argument that it looks two generations old that I mentioned earlier. 
I'm on the PS4 version, keep in mind, so my screenshots and footage look worse than the game could look if I had a PS5. The tracks are fairly simplified, and during racing the models are using simpler geometry. And the lighting model is also different, so my screenshots and footage look worse than the game could look if I had a PS5 but I still compared it anyway to GT6, which is arguably the best looking sim racer of the PS3 360 era, two generations ago. Is that type of hyperbole really fair looking at these comparison screenshots? Most sims don't compete with GT in terms of presentation, period. Look at stuff like Assetto Corsa and tell me this looks the same or better than GT Sport, let alone GT7. And games like Project Cars or Forza go for a look that's more cinematic and dramatic. They aren't supposed to look as realistic as GT, even though they can look really, really excellent. They're supposed to basically always look like the historic race day that will be remembered for decades. GT goes for absolute realism, and in case you didn't know, real life looks kind of mundane a lot of the time. I don't think it's any more fair to hold that against polyphony than it is to try and compare a golf course in a golfing game to a jungle in Horizon Forbidden West and say, look how boring and bland this golf course looks. The aesthetic goals are different. Of course it's not going to look as lush. Duh. And even then, I'd still argue that GT7 looks better than a game like Project Cars 2 or 3 anyway, and has a lot of subtleties in rendering that those games don't offer. It can still look very picturesque at times, and one thing that fans appreciate in GT that is usually unique to it is the attention to detail that we notice but others often don't. GT often captures the quirks that don't register if you're not deep into car culture. As one example, did you know that the old 80s Trueno and Levin vehicles make a clicking noise when you're at or above redline and need to shift? Did you know that GT includes that? Same thing with the beep that is present in FDRX7s for the same reason. Did you know that the simulated wind in the game affects tire spray and the direction it heads in after being kicked into the air? Did you know that the water on your windows is both affected by g-forces, can be pulled into smaller beads as you turn, and slowly evaporates away? You can learn more about the rainy weather effects in GT as well as other things from the channel Formula Digital linked in the description. Polyphony also extensively captured real-world lighting and weather data for GT Sport and GT7 in order to do things like capture true HDR dynamics so that they can be represented at up to 10,000 nits of peak brightness. GT7 also simulates actual cloud movement and cover, atmospheric pressure, and more to try and make the weather patterns realistic, both in terms of how they affect gameplay and aesthetics. They also separate car paint into their component parts, including things like a clear coat layer, to ensure that it's the most realistic representation of car paint and manufacturer colors as possible with current technology and techniques. It's easy to distill all of this stuff down, ignore it, and say the game looks boring. It's easy to pick standard, high noon, clear weather and go, look at how bland this game is. But to the people who enjoy the nuances of realism in their games, we we care about this stuff, just like we care about your vehicle chassis slowly warping, or your engine wearing, or your oil needing changed. These small things have a big impact on our experience and have value to us because of the realism, whether or not it has value to anyone else. That's the intended experience and that's the experience we bought it for. We didn't buy it so that our races could feel like movies. You can buy things like Forza or Drive Club for that. It's important to recognize that all these choices are graphical and aesthetic choices too. This type of nerdy, dumb shit is often what people enjoy about sim racers. It's why even elitists who wrongly believe GT is a simcade series and have since gone on to spend their time in the hardest of hardcore sim racers still return to GT when a new one releases. Because a lot of where Polyphony puts their graphical and aesthetic effort is into the minutia that car and racing 
racing enthusiasts will enjoy. Why is that wrong? And why isn't it unfair to mush all of this effort into, but it doesn't wow me like insert game here does, when people will gush over similarly minor details like realistic horse animations in Red Dead 2, or realistic water rendering in Sea of Thieves? Besides, you can't seriously look at this and tell me it doesn't look wonderful, keeping in mind that, again, this is the PS4 version. As I said, GT can look picturesque too, but it does so with the relative regularity that real life often does, and that's part of what makes the picturesque moments special, is that every race doesn't look like a postcard. Games like Forza Horizon 5 look absolutely beautiful. They have different goals though, and that's okay. Also, GT7 isn't broken. In fact, before the microtransactions mess that caused people to grow obsessed with tearing the game down, it was being praised for how polished it was. There are minor glitches, sure, and they've had a couple of seemingly very minor issues with saves being wiped, which have been quickly corrected, and I think corrected in the appropriate manner. And yes, there was one update that accidentally put the wrong tires on a few cars in a few events with preset vehicles, but by and large, this game works and works extremely well. It's ahead of most everyone in terms of day one polish, and has performance that would make everybody but turn 10 look like a joke on consoles. And on top of that, Polyphony is working to fix all of these minor issues as quickly as possible, while prioritizing the ones that affect the experience the most for the most people. Likewise, I do understand everyone's complaints about it being always online, but as I mentioned earlier, this game is supposed to be taken very seriously as an eSport, one that's apparently going to be an Olympic event, and though there is a bit of a question mark around this part, it's a game that's very likely still being spearheaded by the largest and most prestigious governing body in all of real-world motorsport, the FIA. And since your single-player garage is shared between races in sport mode and every other mode, it's important that people can't save mod a few extra horsepower into a car without raising their performance points, giving them an unfair advantage in professional races with real award ceremonies and recognition. It's a difficult thing to manage when they have to please partners like this, and Polyphony has repeatedly shown that they aren't the type to abuse players with systems like this. They always try to find a balance between consumers and the visions and intent of the work. Servers aren't constantly going down. Both GT Sport and GT7 have actually been super stable through all of my playtime, except for the one issue near launch for GT7 where they noticed the save wiping issue and took emergency action to help prevent this from affecting a ton of people. The point being, the controversy around this game is massively overblown. It's not a DRM riddled mess like Ubisoft's titles are, and the DRM it has is justified to some extent, whether you agree or disagree with it. I don't love it either, but it doesn't bother me. It's not a broken mess like Cyberpunk. It's not a microtransaction hell like Call of Duty can be now, or like Shadow of War or so many of the free-to-play behemoths we all know games that it has been directly compared to, by the way. The thing that frustrates me the most is the insistence of people who admit to barely playing GT7, barely playing any of the previous titles, or not even playing them at all, and having no interest in them, on speaking for our community. They'll use their large platforms to get up on their soapboxes and complain for the sake of the community, a community that never asked for their input or help. They will lie and spread misinformation and disinformation to the masses, leading to people in the sim racing and GT community who see things for what they are being treated as uninformed, manipulated sheep who can't see that we're being taken advantage of. The words of these large, dramatic creators have an impact on the community that they're talking over, just as it does every time someone like Angry Joe disparagingly dilutes Call of Duty fans into the Call of Duty faithful, a one-size-fits-all caricature of a complex community with many wants and needs that differ from each other. How is that 
any different from any other large group, speaking for another smaller group without permission, and then simplifying them down to a stereotype in the process. How is that helpful? How is that respectful? And I want to make this clear. I have no problem with people outside of the community discussing their opinions on the genre or GT series. I encourage it, as long as it's truthful and in good faith. What I do have a problem with is them using our community as a scapegoat to further their agendas around topics like game design and monetization without understanding what our community even wants out of these games. There's a reason why a lot of longtime GT fans in the community are fine with the way GT7 works, and it's because it hasn't actually changed all that much, and this is the way we like it. Just because you don't remember that and we do, doesn't mean we're wrong. We enjoy things like earning cars over time. I personally don't like that I literally had enough money after update 1.11 to buy every single road car and most of the race cars in Brand Central, with tens of millions of credits left over, when the game was barely a month old at that point. It's not for anyone else to suggest that that feeling is wrong. These content creators making the most noise do not speak for us, so I wish that they would stop trying to white knight when so many of them really only seem to care about creating drama and deceiving people for money. Ironic when you really think about it. I am all for discussing the pros and cons of the changes in GT7, down to the most granular of levels, but just like any community, shouldn't our opinions hold a little bit more weight based on how ingrained we are in the series, how much more it affects us when things are changed in the series, and how much more expertise we often have on the subject? Even the mundane stuff that doesn't cause mass review bombing and such can be frustrating or hurtful when you don't feel like you, as part of the community being discussed, have the same reach with your voice as those speaking for you. The spotlight is on people like myself, and yet the mic has been ripped away from us like we're circus animals expected to perform the song and dance put on by these large content creators. Other times, it's just ignorance, like the G4 review of the game. I don't mind that they have differing opinions, and I actually like the new G4 and the people on it, to be clear. They obviously put in a lot of effort for their reviews, but isn't it callous and kind of rude to suggest that things like the easy listening menu music and other parts of GT7 are outdated, as if the community of people who actively look forward to and value these small aspects of the experience are somehow less culturally informed or have worse taste? Instead of outdated, why can't it just not be to your liking? And that's to say nothing about the more drastic cultural differences that themselves informed these decisions in the game design, considering GT is a Japanese series, and the early games leaned much more heavily into these composed tracks in their home country, before being changed to licensed soundtracks in the West. Can we not think just a bit before we suggest that this is inherently a less tasteful or more outdated avenue for the aesthetics? Can we not contemplate why GT may make some of these choices for their longtime hardcore fans who enjoy them? It's the same thing with criticism of the lack of a sense of speed. Can we not ask why it might have less of a sense of speed than games that are trying to be more bombastic and dramatic before we suggest it's an inherent fault in the design? It's frustrating for me because it feels like I don't have an adequate voice, despite being one of the people entrenched in the successes and failures of this series. If you play GT7 for 5 hours and then never touch the series again, its choices impact you far less than they do someone like myself, when I've already put in well over 100 hours and plan to keep going. Just like I always have with Sim Racer since I was a teenager, I do try to be very critical of GT's choices, because more than any of these people who don't play my of the series, of course I want it to be better. I want as much of my massive playtime in each of these games to be valuable to me as possible, so instead of assuming that fans like myself are going to be incompetent and blind in our assessment and that you have to speak for us, why not let us speak for ourselves?
This video is likely to reach nobody, and if it does reach people, I'm likely to get swaths of comments from people who don't play GT talking about how I'm a shill and can't see how I'm being taken advantage of. That's not fair when people like Luke Stevens, who overall I don't mind, and people like Review Tech USA, who I very much do mind, can make videos that get tens of thousands of views or more completely misrepresenting the experience and washing away any real discussion of the topic by people like myself. And to be clear, I don't speak for the community as a whole either. Nobody does. But I think it's fair to assume we have a bit more authority on the subject. We can get things wrong too, but I don't think it's up to casual players or people who don't play the series at all to decide when that's the case. It's the ferocity and superiority that so often accompanies these videos that necessitates a response like this from me. The problem is not the discussion. It's the presumed authority with which these people speak while getting countless important details wrong, and the expectation from some of them that the fans conform to their beliefs, claims, and conclusions, or else we're part of the problem. I don't really think that's okay. I don't like being shut out of the conversation about how I'm supposed to feel about my own hobbies. I've seen it suggested that I shouldn't take the hyperbole being used by some of these big voices so seriously, that I shouldn't be treating it with such importance. But it is a threat. How often do we see such hyperbole being paired with misinformation and disinformation, and then watch as it's weaponized as a rallying cry by one group against another group, all in an attempt to defame and discredit their arguments and ideals wholesale, in an attempt to suggest that they aren't fit to be heard without actually ever hearing them in the first place? This hyperbole can be dangerous when paired with straw men and suggestions that those being talked talked about are ignorant or helpless in some way. I think it matters when lies are consolidated with phrases like Gran Turismo 7 is an overhyped joke, or suggestions that it's an always online microtransaction riddled train wreck, by large voices that are seemingly more concerned with their own agendas than any actual improvement to the series. These types of overbearing, hostile sentiments are not created in a vacuum. They are used for bullying and harassment and are worth taking seriously as a problem particularly when it's considered an overreaction if community members like myself are upset by that fact, when we're the ones who are being considered as irrational for defending ourselves, our interests, and our hobbies. Their choice to attack first often means that we're the bad guys when we attack back? How does that make any sense? Yes, I'm bitter about it, because I don't want all of this stuff to overwhelm real discussion of the game, or even real discussion of topics like the economy and design. I frankly just don't think it's fair, nor is it productive. It's not that I don't want this to ruin GT7 and just want to enjoy the game I bought or whatever. It's not about the sunk cost. I mean, I don't want it to ruin GT7, and I do want to enjoy the game I bought, but my main concern is that I don't want this game's legacy to sink down into the mire of disinformation, hyperbole, and hate mobbing that has been delicately crafted by people who want to hijack the game for their own motivations, by people who don't play the series or the genre and therefore aren't really impacted by the consequences of their choices and words. Instead, actually involve the people you're impacting with your discussion and get your information right, or frankly, keep out of it and stop exploiting us. Nobody asked you to be our watchdog, our savior, or our caretaker, and we are keenly aware that, for some of you, that's not really your goal anyway. We see through you. Let us speak for ourselves. Thank you very much. With all of that out of the way though, we can finally talk about the actual upsides and downsides of GT7. Thank fucking god. Let's start with the good and the neutral. Which honestly is most things. I may be really disappointed in this game, but it's not because it's not good. It's not because it's not more than playable. And it's not because I don't want to keep playing. It is good, it is more than playable, and I do want to keep playing. 
GT7 looks fantastic, sounds fantastic, feels fantastic, and is pretty damned polished, no matter what anybody says. And that goes for both the PS4 and PS5 versions. It's just as polished as GT Sport was, if not more so. Loading times on the PS4 are fine enough and are fantastic on the PS5 from what I've seen. Beating all of the cafe menus, which is the core career of the game, took me 40 hours. It then took me around 100 hours to complete everything else because a few of the circuit experiences were made far more difficult than in GT Sport and required some real effort, even at my skill level. I've since played around 60 more hours as of writing this, including all of the new races added in updates, and by the time this video is out, it might be well over 200 hours total, with more to come. Some people are saying the game didn't offer enough content at launch, which is fair I guess, but I really don't think that's the problem. The problem is the length of the races themselves, which I'll get to later. For me though, that 40 hours that it took to complete the cafe menus was an adequate enough amount of single player content to start with, and I'm glad that they've dedicated themselves to adding more, both in the world circuits, which hopefully includes more cafe menus, as well as the missions and music rally sections. They're also adding more online racing offerings, like time trials with rewards, which will hopefully serve as a sort of replacement for GT5 and GT6's seasonal events. That was some of my favorite content in those games. I enjoy that kind of indirect competition with real people a lot. The car list is really nice and has a lot of cars that I've missed. It's also nice to see GT's level of precision and detail applied to a lot of cars that were previously only seen as standard vehicles in GT5 and 6, meaning they didn't offer cockpit views and were really simple in terms of texturing and geometric density back then. Now they have just as much love and care put into them as every other car, down to the smallest details that, as I said earlier, only people like myself will care about. But we'll care about it a lot. GT is still the absolute leader in regards to these details, even if games like Forza are absolutely nothing to roll your eyes at, by any means. The tracks are also as fantastic as ever, as is the track choice. While I'm a bit disappointed that there aren't any new fantasy tracks in GT7 yet, I'm delighted to see ones like Trial Mountain and Deep Forest return. GT is also the best at creating believable circuits, and the original offerings here prove that, with a fantastic new coat of paint on top of that. I'm hoping to see other classics return too. Seattle, Iger Norwand, El Capitan, Cita de Aria, Costa de Amalfi, along with Monaco are definitely my top picks for tracks I want to see return. I also would like to see a snow track or two return as well, or at least something new in the special conditions category. Maybe it would be cool to see Pikes Peak or the Goodwood Festival of Speed Track return, complete with cars like the Pikes Peak Escudo. The tuning and parts section has also seen a nice upgrade in terms of offerings. It's nice to have access to things like anti-lag and drift-centric modifications, and Polyphony has said that they're adding even more parts, though I'm unsure if these are mechanical parts or visual customization options, which are also generally pretty great here. Wide bodies are a particularly nice addition. The livery editor has been improved in a lot of subtle ways as well, and it's still fantastic to be able to share that sort of thing across the community, as well as replays and scapes photos, which I'd still argue is the best photo mode in the entire industry. I did a video on it a while back, if you want to know more about why it's so special. Some of the other things I really like are smaller changes. For example, I appreciate that traction control is now universal across all of your vehicles, instead of defaulting to three each time you buy a new car. It's way too strong even set to one, but they also don't allow noobs to activate it on dirt anymore, which is great. And I like the new assists, though I do miss the cone markers that were in GT Sport. The physics here are fantastic. Not perfect, there are minor issues, but still fantastic. I personally love the way the game feels, and as per usual, Polyphony excel at translating good game feel to the controller, which every other sim racer except for Forza struggles with immensely. While offerings like Assetto Corsa let you have really granular control over how the gamepad feels, it's still really, really difficult to make the game feel great on a controller. 
polyphony gamepad controls always feel perfectly natural, and GT7 is no exception. The new weather and time of day systems are also the best in the genre, unsurprisingly. GT was one of the earliest series to do this with GT5 and 6, and they did it well enough for the time, but here? This is the first game where I've actually truly enjoyed driving in the wet and looked forward to it. When they spent all that time in the PlayStation State of Play talking about wet weather, I kind of rolled my eyes and said, cool, but wet weather sucks, so I'm only going to use it for goofy stuff. But holy hell, I was wrong. If you don't know, in real life, Rain doesn't just sit on the road surface as soon as it lands. Every type of surface has a saturation point. Before this point, it will continue absorbing water, meaning while the surface is getting colder, you don't really have issues with hydroplaning early on. Once the surface is saturated though, then standing water becomes a problem and grip drops off a cliff. This is even worse with puddles. Well, GT7 simulates all of this to a fantastic degree. It all feels completely natural and organic, and is shown to you very clearly on your HUD. But it doesn't stop there. Puddles form and fade realistically based on the geometry of the track, sure, but they also fade much slower than the rest of the track dries, just like in real life. The game simulates the fact that the racing line grows more slick than the rest of the track since it's coated in rubber from tires constantly driving on it, and wet rubber on wet rubber is incredibly slick and smooth. But it also simulates the fact that the parts of the track which are most commonly driven on dry first. You can actually see these parts of the track drying faster based on where everyone is driving. It's dynamic rather than scripted, which makes the racing itself super dynamic. Again, I usually don't like driving in the wet very much in Sims. It's rarely that rewarding, instead just sort of turning the surface into ice with running through puddles being even worse. But here, there's so much more to think about, particularly in endurance races. It's addictive in a way that I didn't know rain racing could be in a game. And that says nothing about dealing with the visibility issues caused by spray from other cars, how the rain impacts the great new tire model, etc. While dynamic time of day and the sky simulation have less of an impact than the rain itself, they are also fantastic additions as well. You don't really realize how great it is to have clouds roll in and a race enter evening as you drive until it happens. And just like a lot of other things, Polyphony is okay with being subtle about this, thankfully. They realize it doesn't always have to impact the race itself. Sure, it's cool to start in the evening and end up racing at night, or to have it start raining during a race, but it's also nice to just have visual progression and change during a race. It's okay if instead of some dynamic rainfall or something, you're just watching clouds clear out as the sun starts to rise while you lap a circuit. As I mentioned earlier, I've also seen people, again, generally casuals, complain about the lack of a sense of speed in GT7. But as is well established at this point, GT is about realism. Similar to the graphics, the sense of speed you often get in other games is intentionally ratcheted far above real life, for the sake of the thrill. This is usually done through things like motion blur, the focal length and type of lens on the camera view, camera shake to make the car feel more unstable than it is, etc. The field of view in particular drastically changes the sense of speed, but the point here in GT is realism. You can find in-cockpit view driving from real drivers of vehicles like Le Mans cars, some of the fastest race cars in the whole world, and it genuinely often doesn't look that fast. It looks remarkably similar to GT in fact. The reality is, the sense of speed you might be after if GT feels slow is exaggerated. It can often get in the way of proper racing technique, because even though you technically don't have less time to react when a sense of speed is the focus, it still feels like you have less time to react. If that exaggerated sense of speed was realistic, then racers you see jumping from sims like GT, R-Factor, Assetto Corsa, and iRacing to real world cars would be running into huge issues with reaction times and their ability to race well, because they'd be used to having so much more time to react in these games than reality. It's totally fair if you want a higher sense of speed, but that's not really the point here. 
my point here is that the game itself has a solid as heck foundation overall that I don't know if I could be happier with. And as per usual, Polyphony has committed to continuing to add to this for free along the lifespan of the game, ensuring that if you keep playing, you're all but guaranteed to get your money's worth. Unfortunately, that's not all there is. I said this game is a disappointment, and that I have a love-hate relationship with it, and there are reasons why that is, so let's start with the mechanical issues then. Some of these are small things. For example, I still don't understand why we don't have the option to use the clutch on a controller. I play GT more than any other sim, and I don't have the money or space for a wheel, so it's frustrating that I don't have the option to simulate using the clutch while playing, when games like Forza have been doing it since Forza 3 in 2009. Sure, there are already far more controls in GT than you can fit on a controller. You have to make sacrifices, but why not let me make those sacrifices then. Most cars I'm driving won't have things like DRS, nor will I personally be putting nitrous on most of my vehicles. So why not let me swap the button I have set to that out for the clutch when I want to? And for that matter, why not let me save controller presets that I can call up in the assists menu before a race? That way swapping to different control schemes for different purposes is quick and easy. Other little control quirks plague the experience too, like the fact that you can't switch camera views at the beginning of most event types until right before you gain control of the car. For someone like myself who enjoys using different views for different purposes, it can often screw up the start of an event, necessitating needless restart or at very least causing unnecessary minor mistakes. Or there's also the fact that you're not able to press a next button in the license tests to go to the next test, which previous games offered. Or the menu in license tests always defaulting to exit instead of retry after a test. And also only hanging there for a short while before it puts you back on the test menu automatically. Like, I get the idea of defaulting to exit after you've obtained a new medal ranking. Not everyone is going to be experienced enough to just keep going for gold until they get it. For some people, that might take weeks. But if I'm trying and not getting new medals, more than likely I want to keep trying as quickly as possible. So let me do that. Performance measurements in the tuning menu could also use some minor tweaking, since it always shows changes to stats in blue, instead of blue if they improve and red if they get worse. That sounds small, but it makes reading my changes at a glance much harder, when I have to actually read the stat itself to see if the changes to lateral G or whatever were heading in the direction I wanted. The parts shop is really hard to navigate too at first, because it's separated by rarity instead of part type. So if I'm spending a few minutes in there trying to best balance out some upgrades for a performance point recommendation in a race, I have to keep a tally in my head, like, oh no, should I buy sports brakes? I think I already bought carbon ceramics? Or was that just the racing brake pads? Not to mention the chance to forget that a later option even exists, like buying the fully customizable manual transmission when you mean to buy the fully customizable racing transmission. Like, everything is generally laid out in ascending quality between the pages and are in a roughly consistent order, but it still feels scattered and confusing when I'd rather just sort it all by item type. Even now, though I've pretty much got it memorized, it takes me longer to navigate than I really feel is necessary. I'm also frustrated by being unable to change cars in career pre-races, or by parts in the car settings menu still. Like, as I've said, the game on PS4 Pro runs well and looks nice, and it loads most things pretty quickly. I figured it'd be a slog compared to GT Sport because it's cross-gen, but it's not. And yet the loading times are just slow enough that having to check race parameters, only to find that I don't have the right type of car, or it's got far too low of a performance points rating, and then having to go back out to go upgrade it, it gets a bit tedious when things like time trials allow me to change my car in the pre-race lobby. For that matter, it would be nice to be able to simply see a list of every car in the game and add any of them to the wish list from there, so that I know when they show up in the used and legendary dealerships without having to run across the car once already. 
Also, some dialogue auto-progresses and sometimes does so really quickly, while other dialogue doesn't, which for me meant multiple lines across the career that I didn't get the chance to read or accidentally skipped entirely. I like that they have genuine GT community members talk to you before races and such, but the things they say often feel disjointed, end suddenly, or don't add much value. It's rough dialogue. I don't mind hearing about their past and their successes, their prestige, or their preferences, and I don't mind getting advice, since some of it is genuinely useful, like warnings about weather during a race, but some of it feels like it's just thrown together. Plus, while I'm not going to say one way or another, a bit of it feels kind of… insensitive? Like one of the French drivers always bringing up eating baguettes before the race? I don't know if this is a joke he was in on, or maybe they all got to write their own dialogue for the game, but without that knowledge it raises an eyebrow a bit. Also, Polyphony, can we get a pre-race weather forecast thing please? Race music also seems to be highly limited based on what career races you're in, so it repeats a lot even though this game still has a relatively large soundtrack. I love Daiki Kasho, but it comes on way too frequently because it seems to prioritize it over a lot of the other music. Or more likely because there's 50 million Daiki Kasho songs in the game and only one song basically from every other artist. I like Nothing But Thieves, for example, so I was glad to know that they have a song in the game. In the first 40 hours, I only ran across it three times, and once it was at the start of a race I had to immediately retry, so I didn't even get to listen to it. There are also a few issues with the economic design that I'd like to point out. In spite of the overblown claims about microtransactions and whatnot, some things still could be improved. Firstly, even though the legendary car and used dealerships were doubled in size in a recent update, they're still pretty sluggish to move cars through. During the career, the used dealership just seems to rotate in the cars I'm supposed to unlock for doing the cafe menus. If unlocking them for free was difficult, I could understand that as an option, but it's not difficult at all to just unlock them by beating the career events. So the only reason I can see it being there is if you wanted more than one of a specific car that shows up in these cafe menus. It's kind of a free opportunity to do that. After you beat the career, both the Legends and used dealership start to rotate cars in and out daily, just like the PlayStation State of Play said before release. It's not like GT4 and 5 though, where every time you do something, the game moves forward an in-game day. They were talking about real-life days in that state of play. The running theory, which I believe is correct, suggests that these dealerships are community-wide, so it seems as if only a certain amount of each car can be bought by all players, before they enter the limited quantities status and eventually are sold out. It doesn't seem to be that the oldest cars automatically go limited and then get sold out after a certain amount of time. At least, not if they're being purchased enough to run out. But there are some times where no cars will rotate out for multiple days because nobody's buying enough of them, I guess. And also, newer cars will go limited and leave sooner than ones that have been there for longer. Again, giving credence to the idea that everyone shares the same dealerships in stock. I don't mind this concept, but even with the larger dealer lists now, it can still feel painfully slow at times. Though the old way of doing things wouldn't work particularly great anymore, considering this car list isn't the size that it was in GT4 or 5. Plus, the used shop can include cars from Brand Central, not just cars older than 2001. While you get a deal on these, that also unfortunately means that it's harder to find the older cars you want if a car that you can buy in Brand Central ends up taking the spot that rotates. The game also warns that you might want to take a used car into GT Auto to change the oil and the like right after you buy it but I've never found one, no matter how many miles it had, that didn't have everything in excellent shape right after I bought it. More broadly in terms of the economy, I'm kind of frustrated that roulette tickets nearly always seem to give you the worst reward. I have gotten some pretty great rewards from them, but I also get the worst monetary reward probably 85% of the time. At this point, I suspect I've opened around like 70 spins and only gotten maybe 6 cars, 
four monetary rewards that were better than the bottom tier, two car parts, one invitation card for Brand Central, and no engine swaps. It makes the roulette tickets feel rigged, and therefore, they frustrated me more than they improved my experience across the career. They're also the only way to get engine swaps as of now. There are only a very, very small handful of swaps that you can make with specific engines and specific cars, and there are no drivetrain swaps. It feels very backwards, considering Forza has had these options on a much grander scale for over a decade now. Anyway, you also stop getting rewards for collector levels at like level 22, despite there being 50 levels total. If roulette tickets are rarely going to give you something worthwhile, and there are only 50 levels, why not just give me a ticket for every level then? To roll it back just a bit, I wanted to mention the invitation car system briefly, before we move on to the racing itself. In total, there are maybe 15 or so cars in Brand Central that can only be bought after you've earned an invitation. It's honestly not the biggest deal in terms of cost. Most of these cars aren't terribly expensive, and since it's such a small portion of them, it's not a major nuisance in most cases. What's more, while the value of this is extremely debatable, it does mirror real life, where you often have to be invited to buy these cars by other being extremely wealthy and or important. Contrary to what a lot of people might think, you can't just save every paycheck you get for 10 years and then call up Pagani and ask them for a Huayra. Still though, because of the way the roulette tickets work, it isn't particularly simple to obtain these invitations. They only appear in higher star rated tickets, and since they're a higher tier reward, it's exceedingly uncommon to land on one. You're guaranteed one in the career, and then I got one other along the way, but otherwise you're not going to land on them often, and there's a chance that you might even get an invitation you've already gotten before. With at best one chance a day to get these, it can take a while to get them all. It's not the system as a whole that's an issue, as with so many other things in GT7. It's the minor quirks involved, which can stack on top of each other. All of this is relatively minor though, in the grand scheme of things. The real topic I was most curious about when GT7 was announced was the mechanical balance, pacing, and features of the single player. I've been pretty vocal about my frustration with sim racing stagnation in terms of single player content. They love to get into the weeds of simulating racing itself, and that's great, but similar to fighting games, they all seem extremely disinterested in applying even a fraction of that same effort into simulating, or at least dramatizing, the aspects of racing that take place off the track. Sometimes in a fighting game I want more than arcade mode, training, and online battles, you know? Same kind of thing here. I'm sorry, but whether you package it as racing seasons like Forza and Project Cars have a tendency to do, as cafe menus like GT7 does, or don't package it at all like Assetto Corsa does, the careers in these games are limp, stagnant, and lifeless. If they have any pacing at all, it's only on the most basic level, and they don't often provide much value in terms of investment beyond what you do on the track. GT7 does nothing to change this. In the end, it's just a dressed up version of what Assetto Corsa offers. It's basically what we've gotten since GT originally revolutionized racing career design. You can hear more about my preferred idea for a sim racing career in that video I mentioned earlier. The career here is also still insanely oddly paced, as per usual. Just like always, you start out in slow cars, and slowly get faster over time. That's fine, but the problem is that you also start out being expected to use very specific types of cars, like American muscle cars from before 1970 or front-engine front-wheel drive European hatchbacks, which then expand to a much broader range of cars over time. Unfortunately, that means you're extremely limited in what slower cars you can use early on, but then once your options expand, the cars have already gotten way faster, meaning you end up rather limited in what faster cars you can use as well, because many of the slower cars you didn't get to drive before can't easily compete in these faster races unless you turn down the difficulty or know exactly what you're doing. 
What's the point of the KTM Crossbow, or the Radical SR3, or the Alpine A110, or the Renault R5 Turbo, if I can't find a place in the career to use them without pulling out my hair, or making the AI dumb as rocks? So much time is spent in very short races on top of this. Even 20 hours in, I was still doing 2-3 to three lap races exclusively, unless it was on a really short or oval track, in which case they were usually Five laps, and the game spends like seven hours on mostly front engine, front wheel drive hatchbacks and such alone. I genuinely do think this is what contributes to most people feeling like the game is short. 40 hours to complete all of the menus is fine, and around 100 hours to gold everything else if you're skilled is plenty, considering they're adding more content over time. That's as much or more content than most single player offerings that aren't bloated grindy messes. Keep in mind, issues like this aren't new to GT7. They're old issues Polyphony has never addressed, and I think they warrant more criticism than they're getting. And that goes for the wider gamut of Sims as well. They either go so specific in the career and have so few types of cars to choose from that you're always stuck in a competitive but boring selection of vehicles, or they undermine their own progression by not understanding their car lists and leaving tons of cars unusable across the career. It's unnecessary to keep making the cars exclusively faster and faster and faster without occasionally slowing down again. The races also don't necessarily have to get longer and longer and longer. Forza has a huge problem with this. There can be peaks and valleys like a roller coaster so that you always have variety. Slow cars are fun to drive too, you know. Often more fun than race cars. You can introduce supercars, then hypercars, then GT4 and GT3, and eventually Le Mans or F1 without abandoning stuff like shitty EVs for old people or 70s oil crisis sports cars with 80 horsepower. Doubly so, since these games rarely do anything fun with races and series regulations. Where's my hybrid racing series? Or an all Jeep Willys race series? Or a safety car series? And why do we still include things like drift, rally, and now drag racing in the game and not actually utilize them in any meaningful way? Speaking of, I'm a bit annoyed that we still can't create custom sector drifting paths to share, and instead have to rely purely on what Polyphony thinks is best for each track layout. Even if we couldn't pick the exact sector, star, and end location, it would still be nice to be able to pick which corners are made into sectors and where on the track, so that we can have scoring competitions and such for drifting, but we don't have to rely on specifically where Polyphony thinks it's best to drift on a track. Drag racing has a similar problem in a way. There's no representation of mechanics unique to drag racing. No drag tires or parts. No drag-centric visual customization. No bespoke drag vehicles. No burnouts to warm the tires and make them sticky. No staging. No trying to hook up into the optimal part of your lane. No worrying about lane choice. No brackets or tournament structure at all. No choice of racing distance. No depth to your opponent vehicle choices. It's just an automatic staging with whatever car you want to choose against a single static opponent that will never change cars. There are three drag missions in total, I believe, and if you want to pick something like the SRT Tomahawk in each, you can do that. It's not even particularly easy to tell what cars will be balanced against your opponent without a bunch of experimentation, so it's never really a close race without a lot of effort. It's better than nothing, but only just. I'd really like to see more effort put into drag, drift, and special conditions racing in general. Performance points are also still just as broken as ever when it comes to single player. The performance points rating is more granular now, sure, but it doesn't really tell the whole story like it should. A car tuned up to 600 pp is still going to be worse in most cases than a power slash weight altered GR4 car that you bring down to that 600 pp limit, for example. Especially when AI are going to be driving those road cars and often struggling with overseer. It's been this way since the inception of the system, most apparently seen in GT5's shuffle races online. And no, shuffle races haven't returned, much to my dismay. 
Shuffle races were rad because they picked a PP range and then gave everyone a random, completely stock car within that range. It was all about raw driving expertise, kind of like one make races, only with multiple vehicles that were all randomly distributed to each player. But there was also one PP range that was broken as heck because they put low-tier, modernish sports cars in with classic muscle cars. These modern sports cars weren't the fastest by a long shot, but they handled well. In contrast, the muscle cars had way more power, but were boaty and heavy. The problem was that on straights, the muscle cars would max out at like 100 miles an hour, maybe, while the sports cars could exceed 120 plus, thanks to the difference in transmission designs between the eras. This meant that even though the game considered these cars equals, just with different strengths and weaknesses, if you got a muscle car in a shuffle race, you automatically lost unless you played unfair, or it was a very specific, small type of track. The performance point system has improved since then, but it still isn't as well balanced in single player as it should be, though again this is also a problem in games like Forza. An 800 horsepower Evo 8 is going to be a mess compared to the 550 horsepower Ferrari that it's competing against, in the hands of all but the best players. The worst two issues in GT7 though absolutely boil my blood. They're what contribute the most to my frustrations with the game and why, even though I can't stop playing for the raw mechanics, I'm ultimately disappointed in GT7 single player. Not surprised, but still disappointed. I don't really think there are acceptable issues at this point. These issues are the AI and the primary racing format. Firstly, the AI still seems to do the same type of cheating and rubber banding that they did in GT Sport, which absolutely baffles me. Rubber banding in a sim should always be optional, period. I don't need my racing to be close if my opponents can't actually compete. Naturally, you'd assume that means the AI here isn't particularly strong or capable, but if you've played any of the hardest optional races and racing missions, you'll quickly realize that they're pretty competent all around, and yet in basically every mandatory career race in the game at launch, the closer to the leader of the pack you get, the faster they'll seem to go, until the last lap where they usually back off a bit to give you a last opportunity to snag victory. You can easily see the consistency of this rubber banding in longer races, because one lap where you'll get a certain lap time, you'll gain like 15 seconds on the leader. The next lap, despite your consistent lap times, you'll gain only 4 seconds, then 3, then 2, and then the last lap will ease up and you'll be able to eke out 6 seconds to just barely win. If it was random and the AI were just doing better or worse on each individual lap, based on their actual driving skill, it wouldn't be so transparently consistent of a pattern. There's some rubber banding shenanigans going on here. This isn't usually the biggest deal, but it really sucks when you're in a car that only has a few opportunities to catch up because you've stuck to the performance points limits in an unorthodox car. 
Usually something that's light but sacrifices power ends up being a problem. This can make some races nearly impossible unless you drive perfectly because the AI will simply waste you on the straights, and since the cars being driven by AI can vary wildly in the later, faster, and more open regulation races, it particularly frustrates during the later series, where you might get several races in before you realize your car choice just can't compete on that specific track and you have to start all the way over with the entire series just to get the chance to change cars or buy new upgrade parts for a new strategy. Thankfully, I haven't come across GT Sport's fake fast slap times yet, though those mostly manifested in sports endurance races. In GT Sport, even if you were gaining 5 to 10 seconds or more, each lap against the leader, the leader would often somehow still put down a fastest lap time that was seconds faster than yours. In case it's not obvious, that's physically impossible. The player can't gain time on them on a lap and still be slower overall on that lap at the same time. That doesn't make any sense. Thankfully, that never happened to me in GT7. But that brings us to the other major problem, which coats the entire career in a sterile, white paint of sameness. That issue is Polyphony's absolute obsession with rolling starts instead of grid starts. A grid start starts in a stopped position, meaning the pack is really close in the beginning. A rolling start likewise spaces each competitor apart and has them driving at a set speed when the race begins. Polyphony loves to do rolling starts almost exclusively and also spaces the cars way, way out. With this style of rolling start, you're effectively doing a passing challenge until you get to second place or behind the final leading pack of cars. Then it turns into a time trial competition to see if you can go faster than those few remaining cars each lap. It's effectively the same exact thing as the one lap magic missions, except you don't have to wait at the beginning, and there's more than one lap. When I can only be a few seconds ahead of second place by the end, but nearly be lapping a few of the cars in the last few places, that's not a real race. These cars are realistically just obstacles to avoid, not competition. You're the only driver out of the top few starting positions or so that will ever get a podium finish, let alone get first. You're effectively doing a two car race with upwards of 18 other moving obstacles on the track. The problem is, the AI is consistent enough on track that you can often find yourself behind the same cars at the same sections of the same laps if you're consistent, and sometimes the speed at which you progress through the field will therefore consistently leave you with an awkward opponent to pass at the worst part of the track. They'll be taking corners like an elderly person and hogging the track in the very sections where you might be able to make up the most time if the way was clear. It feels scripted, and it's consistent quirks like this that really make these issues frustrating, because if you sit around and pass safely, you might literally not have enough time to pass first place by the end, or you can trade some paint and risk ending your race from an accident, simultaneously ruining the huge clean race bonuses the game offers. The whole structure just feels so outdated. You'd think that would mean the AI sucks, right? Despite this basically being the only GT title where you can choose the AI difficulty for career races, the AI must simply not be good enough to compete, I guess. And yes, while the hard level AI can definitely be a challenge at times, for an experienced player it's only going to provide so much challenge. But actually, to my surprise, the AI doesn't suck at all in this game. It actually can be incredibly competent. If you do these special optional races that have a set difficulty rating of 4 and up, they're genuinely challenging, much harder than any other race on the hardest AI difficulty, or basically any race in the series before this. They also start the pack much closer together in rolling start races, often just 5 or fewer seconds ahead of you. Plus, there are, as far as I've found, two optional races that are grid starts, where there are no mandatory grid starts in the entire career. These two grid start races, if you're curious, are the optional Clubman Cup plus 550 races on Tsukuba and High Speed Ring. 
both are great. And because of that, both make me angry that there aren't many, many more grid star races just like them. They also kind of make me angry that I can't choose level 4 or 5 AI difficulty for every other race. You have AI of this quality here, why don't you use it? You can also do arcade races that are grid starts, and they work great too, at least in completely stock cars that are competitive with your opponent's vehicles, though you can still only use what is effectively the hard career difficulty in these races, so they're not as challenging as the level 4 and up races. Good enough for someone like me, but not particularly difficult. And they'll probably be way too easy for someone who's top level and using a racing wheel. It's just frustrating because I don't understand why the career couldn't have at least been built with all of this AI advancement in mind. Why does it feel like it's copy pasted from games that are a quarter of a century old? The competence of the AI honestly makes me both relieved and much more angry that the game could have instantly been much better by just implementing it more widely across the experience. It still has these options at least, but they aren't utilized where it matters. I cannot stress enough just how much of a damper this puts on the experience while playing through the career. Grid starts with competent AI are a glorious thing to experience if you're into clean racing. It's basically the holy grail of single player sim racing, and GT7 can arguably do it better than most of its competition, but it chooses not to. Some of this stuff might seem insignificant to a lot of the people casually playing, and that's fine. Different things will affect different players, well, differently. But when you're planning on playing hundreds and hundreds of hours of a game like this, and you've been playing the series for over two decades, it becomes kind of frustrating to run into long-running minor issues, steps backwards, or other things which waste seconds of your time here and there or prevent the game from being as good as it could be. Because in the long run, those seconds of minor frustration turn into minutes, then hours, then days of wasted time for people like that. And those races that don't provide real challenge become an unintended grind to get to the good part. I didn't hate my time with the cafe stuff in GT7, but I didn't really enjoy it too much either. And had they not had those few really challenging races near the end, as well as the endurances and stuff that they've since added, I would have been far more disappointed. Those few set difficulty optional races were some of the most fun I've had outside of mission challenges, online, and license tests in the whole series. It feels like such a waste. And even though the races they added in update 1.11 were all rolling start races as well, at least they're largely really closely stacked, so it's pretty close to a grid start. I'd say they're pretty fantastic. <sighs> As I said up top, I have a love-hate relationship with GT7. I love every moment where the game feels like GT should, and I love putting the actual tires to the ground and driving. I love the graphics, the presentation, the weather system, oh my god, the educational aspects, and the style. I love the intent of GT7. But I hate that this game completely squanders most of its easily reachable potential for the sake of traditions people are swooning over and giving a pass. This game doesn't deserve the astronomically high scores it got from most major outlets and YouTubers early on, and it doesn't deserve the misaligned needless hate and witch-burning bullshit that it got shortly after. It is a great, fair game with an absolutely painfully mediocre structure, but a lot of heart. GT7 is the greatest the series has ever been in some ways. The greatest sim racing has ever been in some ways. But GT7 can and should also be far better than this.